also continues developing relationships with providers in the community to develop, implement, and speak on the behalf of those experiencing homelessness. Jeff recently joined the Prince George's County Resilience Project co-designed stakeholder engagement series where his voice and insights will be instrumental in shaping the future of youth homelessness prevention efforts in our community. He is a powerful and effective communicator who uses his talents in the social services arena to act and speak on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves. He does this as the chairman of the Prince George's County Lived Experience Committee and as a speaker of the National Coalition of Homelessness. Jeff is inspired by his ministry, wife, children, and grandchildren. In his free time, Jeff enjoys working out, walking his dog, fishing, and attempting to play golf. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Kimberly King and I'm a student of social work at Salisbury University. And I will be introducing Secretary, Secretary Jake Day, okay? Prior to his nomination to lead the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development under Governor Westmore, Secretary Jacob R. Day served as the 28th mayor of Salisbury, Maryland. Born and raised in Salisbury, he previously served as city council president. His tenure as mayor was marked by a resurgent downtown, including nearly $650 million in new construction, the establishment of two youth community centers, and the creation of a permanent supportive housing program to address chronic homelessness. Secretary Day also previously worked for the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy most recently as director of the Center for Towns, utilizing design, planning, and implementation assistance to establish vibrant, sustainable, small cities and towns. He served as national president of the American Institute of Architecture Students and as editor-in-chief of CRIT, a journal of architecture. He was also elected as the 79th president of the Maryland Munis Municipal League representing Maryland's 157 municipalities and was one of Maryland's representatives to the Chesapeake Bay Program's Local Government Advisory Committee. My name is Christy and I am a social work student at um, Salisbury University. Our final panelist is Kate Ryan. Um, is a Salisbury University alum with a bachelor's in social work. She attends the University of Maryland's Baltimore Social Work Master's Program with a community action and social policy track. Kate has worked as a homeless youth intern with the Phoenix Youth Project and as a homeless youth initiative legal services intern with the Homeless Persons Representation Project. Kate is a proud activist and organizer with a passion for eradicating youth homelessness and advancing black and queer liberation. Thank you guys. Okay, we're gonna move into our discussion questions. Um, and how it's gonna work is I'm gonna read the question and then we're kinda gonna shift over to the TV and see our responses, student responses, and then we'll come back over to the panel and let them all speak on the questions. Okay. So our first topic is emergency shelter. And our discussion question is, how successful has emer have emergency shelters been in addressing youth homelessness? They have been doing their best to address the youth homelessness. Unfortunately, there aren't enough shelters, there aren't enough beds, and there are more homeless people. Um, people are becoming homeless every day. People cannot afford housing. It is extremely hard to even get housing. And once you are on the do not rent list, then it's, 
you're stuck being homeless unless somebody is willing to take you in. Um, even with someone taking you in, you're putting them at risk for homelessness because that could be against their agreement with their landlord. Um, I think the homeless shelters are, they have proven that they are accessible. They do send out, um, if they have beds available daily, they also try to get out there that they are taking people, but you know, it's all, everything is first come first serve. So if you become homeless at six o'clock at night, that is not a good time. A lot of those should, a lot of them are already closed from doing an intake, doing a background check on someone. It's extremely hard. How successful have emergency, emergency shelters been in addressing youth homelessness? And have they proven to be accessible? Do any of us get to jump in? <laughs> yeah, I think we can all speak to that. Uh, well, um, hmm. do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Why don't you start? Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so I think it's first, uh, looking at this question, I think it's important to differentiate the... Um, youth homelessness aspect of this. Um, so emergency, emergency shelter beds for adults and youth um, are very different. And I saw that in Phoenix um, as we created um, a shelter. Um, but again, for those youth, a lot of beds are not available. You know, I, I think um, the, the video we just watched uh, takes a, a, a sympathetic view of what emergency shelter is and does. And, and I think that's important because um, uh, emergency shelters are, they address a need. Uh, there is necessity for shelter because permanent shelter is too scarce, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I do want to start off by saying that, um, you know, there are, there are so many things that, and, and you know, the, the folks to my right and left and, and really probably everybody in the room has expert perspective on this, um, you know, and I think probably far beyond what I have. But I guess what I'd say is um, I am, I, I feel very confident in saying that of all the things that shape experiencing homelessness, of all the things that, that lead to unsheltered homelessness, of all the things that we can connect in majority, like more than 50% of people who are homeless were in the foster care system at some stage of their life. Of all those things that we can connect, homelessness is a housing problem. It is a housing problem. And ultimately, there are not enough permanent shelter, uh, there are permanent housing units available. Uh, and, and that shortage is always going to cause somebody to be, not be able to lay their head on a space of their own, uh, on a uh, pillow in a space of their own. And so emergency shelter provides tremendous value. But how successful have they been in addressing homelessness or youth homelessness? Not, not very, because emergency shelter doesn't solve homelessness. Mm -hmm. Housing solves homelessness. We cannot solve homelessness with emergency shelter. So it, it is a pathway. Um, and, and by the way, this, is, this represents for me like a, a transition in, in where I once was. You know, I was once such a purist that if it wasn't permanent supportive housing, we ought not do it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I since have come to realize, that, you know, what about tonight? It's a pathway. What about tomorrow? Yeah. A transitional shelter, emergency shelter, offer a pathway. I mean, mm -hmm. I think ultimately we have to wean ourselves from that and, and build enough and quick enough responsive systems that get people into housing and keep people in housing. And also, by the way, make sure that people aren't pushed out of the housing once they've got a roof over their head. And that is a, a, a thing that Maryland is deliberately focused on right now. But, um, but I think we also ought to have the conversation about emergency shelters that aren't doing the best that they can. Because there are plenty of those examples. There is abuse. There is predatory behavior, and it's shocking to think that people that have in part of their heart the desire to, to, to help shelter someone will also uh, ha exhibit predatory behavior, but it happens. It happens you know, for twisted reasons, uh, twisted logical reasons, and, and I think we gotta talk about that too. 
So have they proven to be accessible? Hit and miss. I think um, it really depends on your definition of success. Does it allow a person to have a place to stay that particular night and provide a warmth and, and uh, food? Yes. Success in regards to moving on, on to the next step and seeking the wraparound services that they need? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And I speak very emphatically about this because I used to be a program director of the only men's shelter in Prince George's County. Prince George's County is one of the largest counties in the United States. One men's shelter, 34 beds. Mm -hmm. I went back to volunteer at Prince George's County's men's shelter because I was homeless there for two years as I rebuilt my life. And I knew some things had to change. The wraparound services they try to provide, but the bureaucracy above the shelters, when we're talking about Department of Human Services, Department of Social Services, there's a time frame allotted for every bed. Well, I hate to tell you this, but if you've experienced homelessness or any type of traumatic event, it doesn't come with the time frame. It doesn't come with the 90 day, you gotta release that bed and it's time to move on and we hope you're successful. It doesn't work that way. We need more emergency shelters to lead to primitive supported housing. I think COVID had really shown America the need for shelter. In Prince George's County alone, the numbers got to be so bad that we converted a hotel, a five floor hotel, mm -hmm. into an overflow shelter. That hotel still exists today. So there is a need for emergency shelters, but more importantly, there's a need for a skilled, trained staff to run those shelters, mm -hmm. to stop the predatory behavior, the harassment, the not understanding of what, what self-harm is, what not understanding what trauma-related events are, how to de-escalate. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw on the film that someone mentioned background checks. Those need to be eliminated. Mm. Barriers need to be eliminated to allow people to come into the system and then allow the system to be able to help them. When I think about the question, how successful have emergency shelters been in addressing youth homelessness? Um, I try to choose my words very wisely and carefully, but still in the front of my mouth, I'd say they've been as successful in getting youth to turn away and run away as fast as they can. Um, the majority of the youth that come across Phoenix Youth Project's program, they are self-referrals. Um, and they, or they're referred by friends, or they're referred by someone who has previously received services from Phoenix Youth Project. So there's an understanding, there's a relationship that we've been able to build with the youth who are, you know, find themselves in housing crisis. And during our orientation, when we're getting them involved in our program, we ask them the question, are you willing to stay in a shelter? Before we would just ask that question and just assume that a young person would just, would tell us the truth. It's a yes or a no. But we started to realize that there were young people lying, saying, yes, I'm willing to go into the shelter when they knew that the answer was absolutely not. I'm not willing to go into a shelter. I'm not willing to have to hide who I am just so I can have a bed. I'm not willing to go through bullying from perceived caseworkers or case managers or directors because I just need a bed to sleep in. I'm not willing to degrade myself just so I can have a bed, but they find themselves, they may not be willing to go to a shelter, but for whatever reason, because we ask that question, they feel like, well, you have to. Because if you, if you refuse shelter, then you refusing help. And that's not the case. And these are just lived experiences. There are young people that we're working with today who we know that they're not gonna to go to a shelter, even if a shelter bed comes available. And we can't fault them on that. They have had tremendous experiences and these experiences validates their, their, their need for their voices. Um, and so when I, I think about if youth shelters are accessible, no. One, shelters, emergency shelter needs a whole new rebranding. I mean, youth don't wanna come. 
And that's because these shelters are, they never had youth in mind when they were building these policies. They never had youth in mind when they were creating these rules, these guidelines. A warrant check? You want me to go to the police station first and then come? I've had so many young people just say, you know what, I'll figure it out just on that alone. And so I think we, we have to, we, if we are going to keep with the emergency shelter model, and obviously we, there are people who are gonna need emergency shelters, we have to look at the policies and these, and these barriers because shelters have been very successful in turning youth away just by not being appealing or literally just turning them away. Amber, can I add something? Yeah. Just a just a, a point of information. Um, this legislative session um, and just signed into law uh, last week uh, is a, a bill that our department wrote that um, got modified. Uh, it would have created a licensing system and inspection of every shelter in the state of Maryland mm -hmm. um, and re regulatory regime around every shelter. Instead, that has turned into an analysis of of um, barriers to uh, entering shelter and some of the conditions at shelters uh, that we uh, owe a report on uh, later this year to the General Assembly uh, in which case we believe there will be plenty of evidence for a licensing system um, for uh, uh, for shelters in the state but I think all of the everything you just heard is the reason why it's important that if you want to be in the business of providing shelter to human beings, mm -hmm. then you, there's no reason you shouldn't be monitored. We provide detailed, invasive inspections of animal shelters, mm -hmm. yet don't provide that at all. Anybody can say, yeah, 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 you know, I'll, I'll accept people over here. Oh, but I, I won't accept certain people. I won't, you know, and, and oh, by the way, I want to, you know, dig into your background before I let you in. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think there's plenty of argument for why that's necessary, but over the next year, the state of Maryland will be conducting a study of the need. I think one of the, the funniest things about that, that proposed legislation was so many people thought it was gonna have so much support. Why wouldn't you want accountability? Why wouldn't you want someone to help guide you? Um, being able to share my voice on that and do uh, a written and oral testimony on for that legislation honestly opened my mind a lot to realizing that not everyone sees homelessness the same, but a lot of people love claiming that they work with the homeless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we have to be very weary of people who say, I serve the homeless and start asking the follow-up question, in what way? because your way may not be my way or or you know it's it's just interesting and in that note i i served for the um shelter transformation committee of the coc of baltimore and we were creating a standards of care for emergency shelters in baltimore and it's just really funny the people who are creating these standards have no idea what is actually going on in these emergency shelters no idea. And creating all these uh, rules for the guests who are staying there and um, kind of like standards, um, yeah, standards for them to stay there. And it's just, it, being in that committee really made me realize like the disparities between what's actually going on in those shelters versus what's going on in the policies. And, mm -hmm. So. Thank you guys. All right, our next topic is going to be the justice system. And our discussion question is Many how- of the youth come in from the juvenile system. Sorry. <laughs> how has our justice system enabled youth homelessness and how can we address the issue? So most times are, many of the youth come in from the juvenile system most times are just trying to survive in survival mode, mode. So some of them are trespassing to find warmth or 
some are committing crimes as far as stealing, you know, theft is high, high rates of theft um, in the stores, or some even trafficking themselves to try to survive. But the main thing is when they are released from the juvenile system, the ways that we can address the youth homelessness from the juvenile system is ensuring that they have a circle of support when they are released from the system and just ensuring that they have that support in place when they are released. The question again is, how has our justice system enabled youth homelessness, and how can we address the issue? Any one of you can start. We love putting our kids in cages. Mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> that, that, that's how I feel. Um, and it, it starts, we criminalize homelessness when there's a fear of God and parents uh, who are in schools, and before they would reach out to the school for help, they're terrified that someone is gonna say something or a teacher's not gonna understand, and so they are reluctant to go get the help that they need. Um, and that in myself, I think, is, is one of criminalization. You're criminalizing the fact that I'm poor, that I'm homeless. Um, my, my child might get taken away. Um, whether that is true now, it doesn't really matter, in, in my opinion, because that has been the myth that has been told us in the community. What happens in my house stays in my house. What happens in my family ha stays in my family. Don't talk about what you, what's happening in this house because I don't want people knowing my business. Sometimes a young person should be able to feel comfortable enough to say, I'm hungry. I don't have food at home. And be able to say that without the thought of, oh, well, the people are gonna come for my parents. Um, I, I've seen that as a way of criminalizing um, youth, and I see it evolved because when we're criminalizing parents who are struggling to put food in their kids' mouths, that means we're also criminalizing the older brother who's dealing to put food in his younger siblings uh, or his family's, uh, um, you know, belly because they're staying in hotels, um, or we're finding, you know, youth who are, you know doing whatever that they can to just make it. Um, and, and they are sex trafficking. They are trafficking themselves. Um, and and the, biggest, the biggest group that I feel like that is doing it that we are really ignoring is, is our black males. We really need to start paying attention to what's happening when, when we're looking at how their situations are putting themselves in danger. And I, and I say that because of where we are on the Eastern Shore. We need to be talking about sex trafficking a lot more than what we're talking about. And we need to start having that conversation when we're talking about our youth who are homeless. Um, and so I think we criminalize the youth who are experiencing homelessness by making it scary to ask for help. That's one way. How we can fix that issue? Stop, crim stop making it like a horrible thing that someone is impoverished. Mm -hmm. Stop making it a scary thing that you're homeless. Like, I want parents to go to the schools and get the resources. In my opinion, the way that I look at it is the schools have more of an ability to help than a community agency does. Um, and so put, reach out for that help. That's, that's one thing for me. That question really uh, stood out to me, and I had to write down some responses because I had so many, and I didn't want to take up the floor for such a period of time. But the justice system itself turns our teens who are experiencing homelessness into criminals. When you start writing tickets and citations and arresting for uh, loitering, when you have no place to go to the bathroom and you happen to use the facilities outside, and some of our youth have even become uh, registered sex offenders because of using those facilities on the outside and not having any place to go. 
Um, speaking on behalf of the National Coalition for Homelessness, I wanted to share this with everybody. We are currently doing what we call a local power tool, tour, which actually aims to educate the public on the realities of being homeless and changing their perception, and also truly aimed at ending criminalization of homelessness. As you know, we just had the, um, the Supreme Court bill uh, standing in front of, was that Oregon? Mm -hmm. the, one of the cities in Oregon about uh, criminalizing uh, uh, the acts that it takes to daily living, but you just don't have a place to, uh, to, to, to do those acts. So um, how can we stop it? First of all, we need to change legislature and municipalities of how they treat homelessness. Uh, we need to stop carrying out sweeps, confiscating personal items of those people. We all know how hard it is to rebuild your life without documentation. And then when you get that documentation taken from you, you have to start all over again. We gotta stop making panhandling illegal, making it illegal for groups to share food with, ho with homeless people in the public. And the one that I love the most is enforcing a quality of life ordinance relating to public activities and hygiene. It's kind of hard to maintain your hygiene when you don't have a bathroom or a shower. So those are just some of the things that we have to really pay attention to and, and really be active with our local municipalities and share our concerns and share what we see. Um, yeah, so our justice system criminalizes hey. homeless uh, youth by creating direct policies that put these youth in, in jail and in prison. Um, I was just at a rally for the um, Johnson versus Grants Pass Supreme Court decision and yeah, the direct, um, the direct way that we can address this is, is housing, is permanent housing. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, the, this Supreme Court decision was just um, a really good, uh, was a really it was a reminder that this is like direct policy. Um, so, um, Jeff, like you, I have a, a lot of thoughts on this, and uh, you know, trying to be concise. I guess what I'd say is, um, I'll be brief on the justice system, but then I want to talk about the housing system. Um, you know, when it comes to our justice system, um, I think we recognize that there are disproportionate effects on. Um, on different populations, whether that be based on uh, their status as a person who's sheltered or unsheltered, whether that be based on race, whether that be based on age in some cases, there are disproportionate effects on certain vulnerable populations. And so, um, you know, has the justice system and uh, has the system of laws that we've created to address whatever you want to call it, quality of life, made it more difficult on populations that are already in the worst possible situation, being homeless and young, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and and as a housing system, you know, once again going back to the idea that um, that the scarcity dynamic drives most of the housing problems that we have, um, you know, affordability, homelessness, etc. Um, that scarcity problem is uh, is perpetuated and exacerbated by policies that we put in place. For example, uh, we create so many barriers to people accessing vouchers. We create so many barriers to people accessing public housing or um, the limited public housing that's left in America or, um, or housing choice vouchers or, or project-based vouchers. And we do that, and it's a, it is a tool and a pathway to affordable living, affordable shelter. We do that under the guise of protecting public safety and things like that. And all we do is take the very same people that we're trying to keep out of housing in those situations and put them right in the same places, breaking new rules, breaking additional rules. And, and what does it do for safety? Not a thing. Chances are it makes the situation worse for the individual, for their, uh, their partners or spouses or or you know relatives that they're living with, um, and and they become you know a, uh, a a refugee in you know among us. They're still our neighbor. They're still you know a resident in our neighborhood. They're still here, 
Uh, not, none of that changes. So I think reducing barriers, um, uh, by the way, which is a, just a good general rule, we should be reducing barriers to housing, period, whatever we're talking about. But particularly when we're talking about you know, um, background checks, criminal you know, uh, background checks, things like that, as a barrier to putting a roof over somebody's head is, is a real problem. and something we've got to work on as, as a nation. Um, in, in Maryland, we just uh, won a grant award recently for technical assistance from the Vera Institute to guide us through helping rewrite our policies for developing housing um, to support uh, the creation of new barrier-free housing units in the state. Okay, so, and speaking on uh, the housing portion and, and the elimination of barriers, I'm not sure how many are, are used to the term housing first. Mm -hmm. The Housing First Initiative has been a tremendous success. And I'm seeing this from somebody who has come from living in a shelter to being a part of a shelter to running a shelter, being that person that says, Jim has a drug problem. So I'm not gonna put Jim into housing, permanent supported housing, even though he's the next per our vulnerability scale, I'm not gonna put him in there because he hasn't taken care of that. But I had the opportunity to go on the other side and understand how housing first works. No one can address the issues that need to be addressed if they do not know have a key to put in a door somewhere. That's right. Housing first, it has done a tremendous amount for the homeless community. But please keep track of what's happening in your local municipalities and in your states because there are several movements out right now that are saying, like the Cicero Act, that are saying that housing first doesn't work. The wraparound services don't work. We could use that money in other ways to you know, fund the homeless population. Mm -hmm. So I just always encourage everyone to stay active in your local communities and in your state, you know, because it's very important, because those bills that pass don't always have backings of someone like our secretary. Yeah, and that that's pay attention is like the biggest thing that, that I heard in that, especially from a local activist organizing perspective. It's so important for the community to know what's happening in the community and what's being said. And if there was anything that I could say, um, and when it comes to housing or when it comes to homelessness, is attend these council meetings. Most of the decisions that are being made are made at the city council meetings, county council meetings, the city work sessions, the county work sessions. That's where the actual work is being done before it's voted on um, before, without any say or input from the community. Um, and, you know, if being in front of people is not your thing, and this is what I'm talking to the young people, like if being in front of people is not your thing or you're, you're not too keen on speaking up at a podium or anything, watch that on YouTube. Cause like awesome people, shout out to Pac-14, um, they stream this live on their, on, their, uh, on their YouTube page. And those city council meetings and those county council meetings, they're available to the public. It's better than Bad Girls Club. Like it's, it gets real and, 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 it's, and it's entertaining. And, and, it's, and sometimes it's sad to see adults bicker and or adults come to this point of where they're not respecting each other, but they want to have a conversation about something that's going to directly impact my life. Um, and so when you said pay attention to your municipalities, yes, pay attention who comes up to these comment, the, the, to the comment sections, the public comments, pay attention, because for every great thing that happens due to community organizing or community advocacy or different organizations, there is a group of people who will just sit and wait for the next city council meeting or next county council meeting to unravel all of that hard work that you've done just to do public, you know, educating the public, to just unravel and spread misinformation. So it's important to be present. That's the biggest thing that if we wanted to address the issue, we have to show up. And when I say we, I mean us as the people, as the community, we have to show up. Thank you guys. All right, our next 
topic is affordable housing. Let's face it. How's it? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the question um, is how have housing prices affected the newer generation's ability to live on their own? Let's face it. Housing costs have steadily risen and only skyrocketed after the COVID-19 pandemic. While wages have stayed stagnant and exploitative, many turn to college and earning degrees in the hopes of having a better wage and to be able to afford to live, only to be crippled again by predatory student loan debt. Not to mention, most employment opportunities have decided to cut costs by making jobs temporary or contract-based, leading to unstable employment and being unable to maintain housing. Other factors, like young adults having limited credit history or irregular income streams, also create barriers for younger generations to own homes, le leaving them to pay high rental costs if they want to live independently. Okay. The question again for you all is, how have housing prices affected the newer generation's ability to live on their own? Well, if you ask them, they're going to tell you, as uh, we did in, the, in a March poll that Greater Greater Washington conducted across the state of Maryland, uh, 99%, I'll bet you can't find another single thing that 99% of Maryland voters agree on. 99% of Maryland voters, age 18 to 34, 99% said they could not possibly buy the home that they grew up in. Oh, absolutely not. Think, think about that. Th think about what that says about the trajectory of a Maryland family, Maryland families in general, or American families. I'm sure you know, you'd find virtually the same thing in any other community. 72% of Maryland voters age 18 to 34 said that they were worse off than their parents. So all, all of that tells us that, um, that they recognize that housing costs in particular are burdening them more than the previous generation. To, to add a couple other data points to it, 50% of Maryland renters are cost burdened. That means 50% are spending a third of their income on rent. And when, when you get down to lower levels of income, it gets even worse. And so the more, uh, the, the more um, you are close to the poverty, close to and below the poverty line, the worse off you are in terms of your housing costs impacting your ability to survive. Mm -hmm. Housing costs are a critical factor, maybe the most critical factor in shaping the poverty landscape in America and in Maryland. And so we got to do something about it, right? Um, that scarcity problem has only gotten worse in the last 15 years. Since 2008, we have simply stopped building housing in this state that has any relationship to our population trajectories and the need to replace housing stock that is decaying and no longer usable. We just stopped. Now, you can understand why we had a, a, a financial crisis in this nation that was based on real estate speculation, you know, the housing market kind of got us to this place. But, you know, in dialing back, we never course corrected. We never said, okay, all right, let's catch up. So now every single year, we're, we're short 96,000 housing units right now. Every single year, we add another 5,600 housing units to that shortage. So every single year, it is just getting worse and worse and worse, meaning housing affordability is getting further and further and further from every single one of us in this room. And do you think that it is affecting every generation equally? No, it is not. Because it trickles down and it affects uh, younger generations even worse. As people don't have, as seniors don't have a place to move into, there is not enough senior housing being produced. There, there are not enough you know, age-restricted or senior or uh, uh, assisted living uh, units and, and facilities being built. And so they don't have anywhere to go. So they're not leaving the big house that they're in, which, oh, by the way, they can't take care of, which, oh, by the way, there aren't enough dollars to do critical repairs on or energy efficiency work so that they can afford their utility bills. Um, if you think I'm passionate about this, you know, mm -hmm. I apologize, but like, you know, this is the issue. This is the thing that is suffocating Maryland families. This is the thing that is suffocating American families. And we are not going to get out of this by creating some program or some mm. policy solution other than to make sure there's enough houses for people. Mm. You know, I mean, it is not a game. But if we were to circle these chairs up and treat it like a game of musical chairs, at the end of the, when the music stops, there just aren't enough chairs to sit in. 
There aren't enough places to lay our head at night. That is not okay. And the effect is going to be people on the street. Mm -hmm. That's the end game. That's what we have created. We are responsible for that. Mm -hmm. We in government, we in private industry, all of us, we are responsible for that. We have to build our way out of this. That can't be the only solution, but we have to build our way out of this. In the meantime, I think the, the Governor's Renters' Rights and Stabilization Act is mm -hmm. such a critical piece to recognize that that's gonna take time. Renters' Rights and Stabilization Act does a couple things to try to help people stay where they're at today. Number one, it dramatically increases eviction filing fees. We had the lowest eviction filing fee in America and the highest eviction filing rate. You think those two things are connected? I think so. I think so. So finally, after years of trying, we increased the eviction filing, uh, filing fee. Um, all of the funding that collected from that is going to go to pay for lawyers for people going through evictions, which, oh, by the way, the landlords all have lawyers because mm -hmm. they can afford to pay them because they're making money off your rent. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it is going to subsidize the voucher, the state voucher program. So we will now have funds to expand the federal vouchers that come into our state. It also creates a renter's bill of rights, a tenant's bill of rights, that will be an addendum to every lease in this state. Uh, it also restricts when evictions can happen. It also creates an office of tenants' rights that will be the ent first statewide entity that is here as the backstop to assist and back up code enforcement efforts at the county and municipal level. And then, among other things, it also creates a, uh, ten the first statewide tenant's right to first refusal in the state, uh, in, in America. Meaning that you as the tenant can buy your apartment, can buy your house, uh, if it's a, a unit up to, or a building up to three units. So we're creating that opportunity to purchase and a right of first refusal, uh, if you, even if you choose not to take the opportunity to purchase, um, to try to keep people in the home that they're in and, and ultimately to try to make them homeowners if possible. So I think we got a lot of work to do, but um, I think, this issue is uh, is issue number one, um, shaping the trajectory of where Maryland goes from here. Yeah, and I think it's a lot as far as what the the state can definitely do, right? When it comes to just the the, the number of homes that are available, but on a local level, ain't doing nothing. We're not holding no accountability. We're we're allowing landlords to rent homes without having the proper capacity to inspect those homes. We're allowing, um, you know, landlords to, you know, ha charge rent higher every, every month or every year they can go up and not just go up a substantial amount, like, you know, maybe 1,200 to maybe 1,250, like, you know, so I'm talking go from 1,200 to then boom, you now have to pay 1,800, 1,900 in a year time. Um, there's, it's like the Wild West when we're talking on a local level to the point where we're now seeing families who were, would have once considered themselves middle class now experience homelessness for the first time. Um, and when we are seeing that, it, it goes to the, to the instance of where's the accountability on a local level. Where is someone trying to say, stop, you can't do that, or that there's a cap for that? Um, and I, I get so kind of frustrated because it's the youth who I see the most impacted on, on the local level. When you have local property managers um, know that they're talking with college students or they're talking with young people and they make their apartment so beautiful, so amazing and all that. They're not explaining to these young people that when they sign this application is, is technically like it's a lease agreement and they need to put the deposit in. Um, I've, I've had a young person think they, they were applying for to get an apartment um, and then they got approved easily. They signed it that when they signed it, it was actual lease and they had to pay the security deposit. Then they had to pay the first month's rent. They were already binded in a contract before they actually moved in. That's a local property manager that was doing that. And when you bring these different topics up, a lot of people are like, well, that's against the law or they can't do that. No one knows. No, no, a lot of these tenants, a lot of our residents have no idea that they're being taken advantage of. Um, it is the Wild West out here. Um, it's the eat or be eaten. 
Um, and what I find is that when we evict a young person and their back balance is close to $8,000 or $7,000, um, what program has the money to pay for that back balance so they can get into a new place? What program has that money? Like a lot of programs now that provide rental assistance and things like that, they have guidelines. They can't do anything that's for things for things that are higher than fair market rate. If majority of the housing out here is higher than fair market rate, that means there are a lot of uh, there's a there's a lot of chance that you know an organization is not going to be able to pay that rent. You want to know why there's not a vouchers out here anymore? Because there's so many vouchers out here in the community that's not being used. Meaning social services, the people who are giving out the vouchers, they can't afford to pay the rent, but they are rental assistance. That doesn't make sense. And so I definitely think there's a lot of things that can be done on a state level, but on a local level, there has to be some change. There has to be some accountability. Can I say three more things? I'm sorry. Real quick. Okay. Uh, number one, I, I forgot an important part of the legislation. So this becomes law October 1. Um, so today there's no uh, restrictions on um, what you can charge somebody on their way into an apartment. So application fees, security deposits, collect first month's rent, the other things like that. State law beginning October 1 is 100% of all you can charge is one month's rent. You know, you can collect a first month's rent as well. So you can collect a first month's rent. Of course, you know, got to pay my rent to get in. Uh, but your fee, application fee, pet fee, security deposit, all that in the state of Maryland beginning October 1, it's one month's rent. That is going to tighten up mm. a lot of activity that currently is predatory today and creates huge barriers on the way in. And people just taking advantage of the fact, again, that there's scarcity. Number two, um, I wanna come back from state to local to your point, Amber, which is this, that um, most control over what housing gets produced it, it exists at the local level. Now, the, the power to zone and, and determine land use is enshrined in the Maryland Constitution as a state power, but we delegate almost all of that to the local level. And, and when we have interfered as a state with that, when we have taken some of that back and said, hey, this is our power and, and you're not doing the right thing and we need to help, typically it has been to stop housing from being built uh, because we say there's places it shouldn't be built, you know, ecologically sensitive areas, agricultural land, stuff like that. And that's great, right? That's part of our kind of smart growth legacy as a state. What we never did was said, oh, by the way, you're failing to produce enough housing or affordable housing. Mm -hmm. We're gonna step in and we're gonna participate in, in making you do that now which we just did with the Housing Expansion and Affordability Act, which was passed uh, by um, the General Assembly. So we're stepping into that space, and it is time, because the, the preponderance of that power will always be at the local level to, to determine what gets built and what doesn't get built. They've got the permitting offices. They've got the, the planning commission. They've got the Board of Zoning Appeals, the Historic District Commissions. That's where the restriction on producing housing is going to exist. So yeah. Ultimately, it takes all of us watching our local officials and saying, what are you doing? There's a housing shortage and you're making it worse? Mm -hmm. I can't afford my rent or maybe I paid my rent but I can barely put a meal on the table and you're choosing to make it harder? How dare you? We better start having that conversation. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that is a, a worthy conversation for us to have. And oh, by the way, back to Amber's point, and this was such a really important point showing up at your city council meetings and your county council meetings. I think it is an excellent idea. And let's remember that those folks you were talking about that show up at the you know, public comment and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and want to unwind things as, as they are done, here's an important note. Uh, that polling that was just completed statewide in the state, 50% of voters said they would never again vote for their delegate or senator if they found out that they were not supportive of an expansion of housing production. Mm -hmm. They would abandon their delegate and their senator, who they pro probably voted for time and time again, if they voted against housing production. This is something that is important to everybody in this state, and the vast and silent majority wants their housing to be affordable. It is a very, very, very small portion of the population that thinks Everything's fine the way it is. And yes, they'll show up and say, don't change a thing. And they'll yell about it. And they'll be mad about it. 
But the vast majority says, what about us? What about us? The, the problem is we've got nothing to stand up and yell about. We've got nothing to oppose. You know, it's just eating away at our livelihood. It's eating away at our family stability, bit by bit by bit by bit. But, you know, there's not a thing for us to yell about. There's not a project for us to oppose. And that makes the dynamic really, really difficult. So we've got to pay attention. So the question that we asked was, how does it affect this newer generation's ability to live on their own? Thanks for bringing us back to where we were supposed to be. Is, I want to take it from the infancy stage, and I just want to share a uh, brief uh, real life story of a, of, of a client that I have a privilege to serve. Single mom of six children. Before I share the story, when we talk to most people who don't really understand the dynamics of homelessness, when you ask people what are the, the, main, what the main factor for homelessness, they will give you various reasons from drug abuse, substance abuse, mental health, etc. The number one is affordable housing. Mm -hmm. This mom of six, her journey started by living with her parents because as a family, they couldn't afford the house that they lived in. So three generations lived in the house trying to afford it. Of course, there was not enough space. One thing led to another, and her and her children started living in a vehicle. Lived in a vehicle and went to a, another state, which is now Maryland. She's in permanent supported housing, and I thank our creator for that. But this is how it's affected the new generation. Five of the six kids are at least two years behind in their cognitive skills because they weren't able to go to school or to be sustained an education for a, a limited period, just for a limited period of time. They had to continually move on. So not only are they working on that, they're also working on their social skills. They're working on, this is my home now. Besides addressing the mental health, and the, the, the trauma that was experienced through the journey of them finally being permanently housed. She has a 19-year-old son who, for lack of better terms, his cognitive level is about 14 years old. He stands six foot four, 220 pounds. When you talk to him, you would think he's able to take care of himself. You would think that he would be able to hold a job. He doesn't have that skill set yet. He's working on those. So how does that affect this new generation's ability to live on their own? How can they get a job that will allow them to afford the pricing that we're dealing with right now? I have a degree. And if it wasn't for my spouse and a few other things in my life, living in the Washington, D.C. area, I couldn't afford the house that I live in right now. So affordable housing has impacted this generation before they were ever born. And the impact is still affecting them today. So I really appreciate the point of, we hear that the cause of homelessness is substance abuse and um, the list can go on and on. But the, the point is that homelessness rises um, when rent rises. And um, the direct cause of homelessness is a lack of affordable housing. And I think that that needs to be talked about more, more than maybe these other things that come into play. Um, but yeah, when, when, when rent rises, so does homelessness. And you see that in different cities with the, highest, with the highest amount of rents, that's with the highest amount of homelessness. And so if we can see that statistically, why aren't we talking about that more? And why aren't we putting that into policy more? Um, as for the newer generation's ability to live on their own, I think you could ask any young person in this room if they're able to live on their own, and every single one of us would say no. Um, I will be coming out with a master's degree, and I will not be able to live on my own for like probably a decade, you know? So um, I think it's also the newer generation, it's a, it's a, it's a known fact. It's talked about on social media. Uh, it's talked about with, within friends, within peers, within schools. It's a known fact, so if, that, so if that's coming to the rise, what are we gonna do about it? Thank you. Our last topic, um, I hold very near and dear to my heart, um, and that is LGBTQ plus and trans youth homelessness. 
Um, and our question is, how can we help LGBTQ plus youth who are more likely to be homeless because of discrimination and lack of support, whether that be shelters or their, their own families? When it comes to LGBTQ plus youth who are experiencing homelessness, it usually stems from an unsupportive family. Whether it be that the youth had to run away because they didn't feel welcome or safe in their own home now that they have come out to their family or in fear of coming out to their families, or they have and they have been kicked out by their families. Um, and as much as I would love to say that this isn't a prominent issue anymore, it is. Um, you know, even if you say that you support it in general, I mean, but you don't when it comes to your kid, you know, and that is the case for many people. Um, and then you run into the issue of shelter discrimination. Shelters are turning you away because of your sexuality or your gender. And that's because they are, some are religious based shelters. Um, and not that they shouldn't be, um, but it's 2024 and regardless of whether you are a Christian based or any other religion affiliated based shelter, we need to be inclusive of all people. The question again is, how can we help LGBTQ plus youth who are more likely to be homeless because of discrimination and lack of support? When you say more likely, the latest statistic says that they represent 40% of youth homelessness mm -hmm. right now, 40%, two times more than their peers. There has to be a system put in place that can respect the rights and decisions of those youth. And those rights and decisions are respected at wherever they're staying. Shelters right now, even though we are trying to make that transition to be more uh, open and friendly, they're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Running a men's shelter and having someone that either doesn't identify or identifies with another gender was traumatic within itself for the staff because we don't have the space, we don't have the education, we don't have the funding that it takes. This is a dilemma that this nation is going to have to address and they're going to have to address it real soon. Because as a nation we say we support our community. We support the LBTQ plus, but it's, it's so eloquent you said on your video there, it's just not in my household. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why it's 40% of all homeless youth are of the LBTQ plus community. So there has to be funding and it can't be something that we talk about two or three years from now and we put it up here and this, that and the other because the numbers just continually grow. We have to have shelters that, that, that are trained, educated staff people that want to serve that community. Besides, we have a privilege to serve. It's not something that we do to go home and take a paycheck. It's a privilege to serve. And that funding has to be there. And I don't want to get too off topic, but it's very important that the people who serve our homeless community, whether LBTQ, men, women, and families, they have to be able to take care of their families as well. Mm -hmm. We pass a lot of money down to help the homeless community, but a lot of that money doesn't go toward the administrative fees for the people who are taking care of that community, the people that care about that community. So what happens? We venture off into where we can take care of our families. We venture into a new realm, and then we bring in that new case manager, that new social worker who wants to come in and change the world. But the fire's taken away from them because they're wondering how they're gonna pay their rent. Mm -hmm. So that's something that has to be addressed as well. So uh, what I would say, there's so much to say about this topic. Um, 
I would say, um, looking at the staff of these people who are serving in uh, either emergency shelters, um, they need to be trained, but they also need to be informed by people with lived experience. And I think that people who um, are part of this community and who have lived experiences, they're not listened to, they're not put at the forefront, they're not taken seriously, and they're usually just there to be um, the spotlight or, you know, the the token. Um, so I think we really, really need to be getting people with lived experience who are part of these communities into policy spaces where they're, um, where they're writing policies for these shelters that are inclusive, and then also training some of these staff um, on what are, what are inclusive standards of care for these shelters. Um, we really need to take them seriously. That's what I would say. Um, look, I I think uh, this is this is an area where we can acknowledge that any any variable that makes life harder um, is going to make the, the experience of being homeless uh, homeless harder, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so a, a person who is already grappling with walking through the world uh, as uh, a member of the LGBTQ plus community and as a young person too um, is is going to be facing obstacles that you know some of us aren't facing, right? Um, and so I, I think it's absolutely true when it comes to, um, to homelessness. Um, Jeff, to your point on, um, I, th I think it, it's an important reminder about um, understanding that there are good intentions uh, often with people running shelters. Even if I disagree with how they're doing it, even if we think there's better. Yes, training can, can help improve that. Um, I think oversight can improve that too. Uh, but, but I think really critically here, um, having a little bit of uh, grace for, for those people that are doing it. Um, and it is a privilege. You know, and when I think of it, it is a privilege, I also think it isn't a right. Mm. You don't have a right to run a, you know, housing for people, um, you know, just like you don't have a right to be a landlord. You have a privilege, you can apply, you can, mm -hmm. you can follow certain standards and rules and take care of the property and treat people with dignity. Um, you know, I, I think all those are basic fundamental uh, standards that ought to exist for shelters too, but um, you know, we're, we're getting there. Um, so you know, how, can we, how can we help reduce um, that discrimination? I think funding can play a critical role I think supporting those very people that you talked about that are working their tail off to, to try to provide some services, um, and you know whether that be training, whether that be you know uh, capital improvements and modifications to shelters to make it possible, um, it's something we don't think about very often. About thinking, wow, the space that we have, all we've got is this church basement, and it's not good enough to accommodate the diverse population we want to serve, or we need to serve. So I think you make a great point that we can, we can certainly do better, and, and money is a, at least a part of the answer. Um, you know, I, I was proud when the governor last July um, put forth $2 million toward um, Safe Haven to, you know, as other states were making it difficult for trans persons to be safe and sheltered in their state, and they found they sought shelter in Maryland. You know, the governor put forth money, which, by the way, it's it's difficult to produce money that isn't already budgeted. You know, you have to redirect. You know, when a crisis hits, you have to redirect, and it's it's tough. And there's a lot of forces that work against you. But but he did, and uh, and, and I think that's you know reflective of not only his values, uh, but also the kind of nimbleness that we need to show when. Uh, when we know there are people that are in crisis. So um, I think there's a lot we can do. I think money's a small piece of it. Um, but uh, I, I think you're also right that uh, training is, is also critical. Well, I actually think money is all of it. Um, just looking at the usage of it or or the the love of it. Um, the biggest thing that I think that we can do to help any marginalized community, um, especially the LGBTQ plus community, but also the um, 
black LGBT youth um, community who I believe we have to look at the data. Yes, 40% of our youth homelessness is made up of LGBTQ, but then also look at the percentage of how many, of black youth, LGBT youth um, are a part of that. And then when we talk about that in itself, that really comes into educating our community and making sure our community is aware and stop making these conversations so taboo. We talk about black culture and LGBT culture on June and in February. That is the only time when we educate our community about the most marginalized communities in our nation. We don't have lessons in school. We don't have a curriculum that talks about the trans movement, the, the civil rights movement that was um, organized through the LGBT movement that was inspired by the civil rights movement. All of it is combined and so we don't educate, we don't put forth enough information in our community and how that trickles down to, I say money makes it, you know, money makes the world go around. We will make advertising and ads when it's June, right? Pride month is getting ready to come up. I find it funny that Pride Month is the only time where you'll see specific programming that is pushed towards our LGBT youth that is either geared toward housing or is geared towards uh, sexual health or is geared towards you know anything. That's the only time we are amplifying that voice, that LGBT youth voice. And because of, in a way of capitalism and just focusing and putting a dollar sign to just marginalized groups and marginalized youth voices, when you think about from a nonprofit standard, right? When you think that I can't change this policy because one of my major donors is probably gonna stop funding a program, that's a problem. Or I can't work with this agency because the schools don't like who's running that agency because that agency was seen at a protest. Or that young person who was uh, advocating for that agency is seen at a, at a, at a protest or, you know, or using their voice in, in a more not, in a riskful way, in a loud way, in a boisterous way. Um, so I think money, money affects it all the way around. Um, and, and, and I also think that money encourages people to do their job. Um, absolutely, there are people who love working with you, who love working for the community and the human service work, but we have to pay our own bills. We have to take care of our own kids. Um, and we have to choose the lesser evil. In a fact, in a way is I will go for another job that's gonna pay enough so I don't end up becoming the people who I'm trying to serve just because I'm just out of circumstance. So we need to fund, we need to fund these agencies who have these hard work and these compassionate people. Um, and when we're thinking about agencies, I definitely say you need training, but we need to fund them and offer training. I think once you require training, once you, uh, Start, you know, making sure that the whoever's coming in your coming in your building is not just about a degree. I mean, I say it all the time. The reason why I work so hard and I love on my social work interns is because I be damned for all. I I don't like the. I want the interns that come through Phoenix to really get that hands-on experience. It's so important for us because you're not gonna get that experience in a book or in a classroom. There's so many social workers or current case managers that are out here now that have all these degrees and they're working with youth and I'm thinking to myself, or even I've heard some of my interns saying, what class were they in? <laughs> what, that's not how, that's not the real world. And so it's so important for like interns to, to have that experience. When I say youth led, I mean youth led. This whole town hall is youth led, youth, youth ideas. Um, having a youth action board is very important. You have to amplify youth voices. We can't just talk to youth when it makes sense or it's in our marketing budget. 
and we only got that little extra in our marketing budget because it's a holiday and our content calendar has to be perfect. So let's make the June Pride things and let's do all of the June team stuff. We gotta stop following capitalism and just because it, it makes us money. And nonprofits and agencies, it's all about money. But if, the, if we were able to get more funding from whatever support to really pour into the, to the people who are actually doing the human service work, we'll be, we'll be fine. I think right now it's just like, I feel like because certain people have their own views, they feel like, well, it, I'm God ordained to help this population. And I think that's the biggest problem. That I'm, I'm, I don't know what God told you, but he ain't tell you that. I mean, my Jesus flipped tables. That's all I got to say. Thank you guys. Do you guys have any closing remarks before I move on to questions? No, I'm really for the questions. I want to hear. Okay. okay. <laughs> cool. I'm going to have my lovely co-intern, Ayana, um, come around with a microphone for anyone who has questions. So just raise your hands, let me know. Or comments. Or comments, mm -hmm. concerns, feedback. Hello. Oh, God, that works. <laughs> OK. Um, my question is, if you all could just give one specific action item. I know these conversations are great and they inspire a lot of people. So if you could tell the people in this room and the ones watching one thing they can do with their inspiration and um, how that can help change the world. The first thing I would tell anybody to do after leaving this room is go talk to a young person. Uh, the reason why Phoenix Youth Project is in this work of providing homeless youth services is because we ask a simple question at an open mic. Something that you wouldn't, you know, there's kids doing dancing and singing and rapping. In the survey, we asked one question. Where did you sleep last night? We got cars, hotels, shelters. In my, in my mom's cousin bedroom. We have to stop calling youth homelessness, youth homeless individuals invisible because they're not invisible. They are right in front of our faces and we need to open up our mouths and start talking to you. So I'm not saying just go around and just start thinking that, oh, that, part, that youth is homeless or that youth is homeless. No, what I'm saying is stop being scared of youth and talk to them. And I promise you, you will get an idea of a lot of things that you can probably tackle, whether it's youth homelessness, whether it's the juvenile justice, whether if it's, you know, schools or anything. The youth have a lot to say, and they just need to be asked one simple question. Hi, how are you? <laughs> My answer would be very similar to that. I was going to say, put youth at the forefront, create youth action boards, put youth in these spaces where policies are being made, um, talk to youth like they're real people. Um, use language that youth can understand. Um, that's a really big thing for me. Um, don't use language that you know someone at, at a fifth grade level couldn't read. Um, put youth at the forefront. Well, um, the, the room is mostly young people. Um, so uh, I'll say to you, um, do the thing that you see that needs to be done. You know, I think we spend a lot of our very short lives waiting for the right time or until we have the degree or the title or whatever. Um, but the way things get done is by people who step up and do them. Um, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful every time. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy every time. But literally starting is by far the hardest thing because it's scary. And initiating it, whether it's starting a program or showing up to a city council meeting or a county council meeting, speaking, listening, coming up with 
a plan or a response that feels like your space in the universe, you got to just do it. Start doing it. Literally start. Start right now. Start tonight. Do it. <laughs> yep. And mine is pretty much in harmony with, with um, his is action creates change. Mm -hmm. Period. Doesn't matter what your action is, whatever that action is, it will create change. So take action. Take some positive action. If it's nothing more than listening to somebody who's in a particular scenario, if it's nothing more than providing a resource to somebody, if it's nothing more than educating yourself on resources so when you do run across somebody, you can share that particular information. But sitting and waiting doesn't change anything. Just take action. Any other questions or comments? Hey, uh, so I'm very number oriented, so I, I have a, a number related question. Um, roughly within the last year, about, again, very roughly, how many youth have you helped directly? I can go first. Um, in the last year, I, I, I serve as a uh, lead case manager for a primitive supported housing program. Um, so in that particular program, we have 17 different youths that we help within the family. Um, then I also serve on, um, uh, thanks to some legislation bills that were passed, uh, <laughs> Prince George's County was awarded half a million dollars to um, uh, sponsor and discuss youth homelessness. And we, I serve on the board uh, with, with the youth as well, so I would say that's probably about another 25 or so. Like I'm a I'm a government employee, um, so I, I I don't you know I don't think it's fair to take credit for um, you know helping youth uh, you know I administer programs and we helped 34,000 Marylanders last year um, have a roof over their head at night uh, that were otherwise unsheltered and another you know half a million Marylanders have an apartment, and pay rent, um, and many more have housing that we've lent them the money for or, um, or paid for. Um, so, you know, the number of young people on that list is pretty significant, um, but is that because I'm in the job? Not really. Um, so, so I think, you know, we all play our part, um, and, and, I, and I get your point, and I think it's a really, it's an important question. Um, we all play our part. And the question is really about what are, what are you doing, I guess for somebody in my role, what are you doing differently, right? Well, it's less about you as an individual and more just the number of you. So I'm not, it doesn't really matter if, if you help less or you help more, that's not what I'm trying to get at. I'm just trying to look at generally how many you are being helped within Maryland or within the nation, within your area. I, Okay, I see your point. I, um, I don't have an answer to how many young people were you know, assisted um, in the last year. I think it's a great question and we should exchange contact information. I'd love to follow up after this. And also look at how we're doing. Like, are we, are we helping more or fewer? Or, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, and I would respond to that and say, not enough. Not enough. Um, nice tunes. I can, uh, <laughs> I can only speak for the area that I'm familiar with, which is Prince George's County, and there is a youth shelter there called Promise Place, mm -hmm. and the beds stay 100% full, mm -hmm. and there's still plenty more youth that need that assistance, so not enough. So the number is very large? Yes, absolutely. So it's, it's probably the largest growing population of homelessness besides the elderly. From a Eastern Shore um, take on it, uh, if you look at our official data, our youth count, our youth census data, um, it would tell you 19. We all know that's a lot. Yeah. Especially the ones who've been in Phoenix Youth mm. Project's office. Mm. Uh, Phoenix Youth Project has serviced on paper um, a little over uh, 65 in 2024. 
2024 just started. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason why I'm emphasizing that 2024 just started is because on average a year we service 80. We're in May and we're in 60. Um, that is to me showing that one, there's not enough youth serving agencies on the Eastern shore because we're just one agency that serves youth homelessness on the entire lower shore. So that means we're not just servicing Salisbury, Wacomico, we're also servicing Worcester County, Somerset County. We're getting those who are transient from Dorchester County. We're getting those who are transient from Del Mar and not the Maryland side, I'm talking Del Mar, Delaware. We're getting folks from Seaford. And when I, I think it's true, we're not serving enough because we don't have the capacity. We're sh all volunteers and interns. <laughs> uh, we don't have the capacity to service as many youth that we're seeing um, coming through our drop-in center, reaching out to us on our social media, um, or you know, just getting our resources because they know that we're here. Sometimes we are not even able to actually physically look at a youth, but they submit a or see them in person, but they submit a referral, and our first um, new member orientation is done virtually. Mm -hmm. Before we can actually physically lay eyes on them, we probably met with them maybe three or four times virtually because they're in a neighboring county and not physically in front of us. So we could probably service a lot more if we had the capacity. But as of right now, physically impacted, we're at about 60-something. And I, I think it's worth noting that that trend line is going to continue to increase because while it looks like we had some great years with lower evictions and, uh, and lower homelessness during the COVID period, we all know why. There was a bunch of federal money that helped us all out. And, you know, and it's uh, gone. Helped, you know, and it's gone. Oh, it's gone. gone. It's, why, it's why municipal and county and state budgets are hurting right now. You know, we, we bought time, right? And, and it's the same reason why it looked like there was a big dip in homelessness. There wasn't. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is why I pay attention to those public comments because everybody would tell you, we're wasting money. Mm -hmm. No, we're not spending enough. <laughs> Matt, would you mind if I also answered that question? Amber asked me last week, as I'm finishing up my internship, she asked me, how many sessions do you think you've done this year? And because I was curious, I went through my email. Granted, some of these may have been canceled sessions, but I had scheduled, I think, 115 sessions Woo! since beginning my internship. But We're excited for the experience. <laughs> for the experience, but also it's it's a it's a great deal but it's also not enough um, there are so many clients who maybe re referred themselves and then could never could never make it could never benefit from our services we've had clients who have come for services and then haven't come back because they couldn't um, or their situation just drastically got so much worse um, and that that in itself is, is painful. Out of the youth that we've served, we don't, we have way, it, it determines the question, like what do you determine success, right? Um, every young person that comes through our office and then they leave, they have a plan or have, they have support. So that's the success rate. We're all, we're 100% successful when it comes there. Yes. But when you look at the data that grants care about, right? how much of that impact, what are the outcomes of those services that you're providing? What is justifying me giving you this money? What, what's your outputs? What are your outcomes from these outputs, right? Um, it's not enough. We're, that's probably maybe in the single digits, in the teens. And that's, and that's because one, we can't house them because it's not enough emergency beds. We can't house them because they can't afford the rent. We can't house them because there's not enough housing. Mm -hmm. Or a young person maybe just recently had a criminal past and they have a felony and that's blocking them from a lot of places that they could probably get housed at. 
There's not enough transitional living housing. So when it comes to housing homeless youth, our success numbers aren't as good as it could be. And that's because of the issues that we've talked about today, the criminalizing of youth homelessness, the lack of affordability, um, the discrimination between um, uh, marginalized groups. So again, yeah, when it comes to numbers, I like, I, I'm a numbers person too. Um, and we're not doing too good. But shout out to your 115. Oh, thank you. Put it on your LinkedIn. <laughs> Do we have any other questions or comments? Someone pass the mic up. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Um, I work in youth programming at a local health department, and my question is, um, how have local health departments, state level health departments, maybe supported your work, and what could be improved? Hmm. Well, one of the things that I feel like, you said in our local health department, right? I had no idea that there was rental assistance in our local health department. I, I didn't learn that until I attended our local regional COC meeting. Um, and I felt like that was an amazing resource, especially when you're looking at finding rental assistance and things like that. Um, but, and then I look at the criteria in order to get that rental, rental assistance. And then I'm like, dang, now I have to deal with the mental health stigma. Now I have to address with having those conversations to a young person about addressing their mental health. Now I have to, you know, it, it's, even though the rental assistance and the assistance is there, it's also the, another whole monster in the room of dealing with the stigma and, and getting that young person comfortable to be vulnerable when their whole childhood or this portion of their childhood, they have to be in survival mode. Um, so something that the local health department can do better, rebrand. The only time young people, I hear them talk about the health department is when they're forced to do anger management or their parents are taking them there to get tested. If, if the health department made it cool <laughs> to, to visit or, or cool to get resources or it didn't seem like a slap on a wrist or it didn't seem like a, a over watcher type of thing, then I think you know young people would be more open to getting the resources. Um, but there's a lot of things that health department has locally that unless you know someone that knows someone that knows someone, uh, some people aren't gonna get those resources. Um, and that goes from rental assistance to also family planning. Like we have a, another group that's overrepresented in our youth homelessness is pregnant teens. And then we also know that youth homelessness um, attributes to a lot more risk factors. We have to look at our, at our local numbers. HIV is on the rise. Syphilis is on the rise. Chlamydia, gonorrhea, and all of it's between the ages of 14 and 26. The age group that Phoenix Youth Project serves and the age group that we're seeing that are experiencing homelessness. So our health department offers a lot. What they could do better is rebrand. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that statement, rebranding. But I must say that um, our health department in uh, Prince George's County, we have really tried to bring them into the continuum of care. And um, they actually put people on the radar that we would not know that was there. And that's very important. And because they deal with a population that may or may not come into the, uh, uh, the system of those experiencing homelessness, they make the transition much easier. So their case workers and case managers will share that information, navigate that particular person into um, the resources that what they need. And um, so that collaboration works very well. But the rebranding is something that's definitely needed. Sometimes we have a lot of funding and money that are just sitting there and nobody ever utilizes it. So it just comes right back off out of the pot and we never knew it was there. So the sharing of information and the sharing of wealth would help tremendously. These are great insights. I, I don't have a lot to add other than to point out that um, uh, let's remember that um, there is no county health department in this state. 
uh, there's only a state health department and each county health county health department is actually just a, a, a local branch of the state health department so there's state leadership which is really powerful um, and uh, the, the secretary of health um, is very focused on finding the uh, the areas where Medicaid dollars and other health care dollars can be utilized to house people and that is news um, and she deserves to be applauded for that um, and and I think we're gonna see the fruits of that labor um, in this state over the coming years because there's a lot of health care money there's a lot mm -hmm. a lot more than there is housing money mm -hmm. a lot more and when that health care money can become housing money we're in a better place now the, the nuance of, of a one of those county health officers and and the, the department at the local level you experiences are going to vary. Um, you know, there is a, a degree of autonomy, but ultimately those big policy decisions are gonna be made uh, at the top, and that is, that is the advantage of a centralized uh, you know, um, system for health departments. Yeah, I would say um, get out into schools more. I think a lot of young people um, don't know what resources and services that the health department can provide. So get out into schools more, advertise more, and definitely rebrand. Yeah, make it make it cool to come in, for sure. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Very good. Okay. Um, I'm gonna say a quick closing remark, and then I'll open it up to you guys. We also have refreshments in the back, so if you did not get a snack, please do. Um, yeah, please do. <laughs> We also, important, um, we have a big QR code. There's one up here and there's one on the table in the back uh, with a short survey on it about tonight's town hall. So if you guys could fill that out, even if you're interns or members, whatever, please fill it out. Um, and then if you are able, we have a QR code in that pretty little frame back there um, to donate directly to Phoenix and our services. Um, Tonight would not have been possible without the Phoenix Youth Project, um, without each of our panelists, um, and without Salisbury's School of Social Work. Um, and Salisbury's School of Social Work is dedicated to serving the greater community. Um, so if you have any ideas um, or requests from us, let us know, and we can try to make it happen. So thank you guys for coming out today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just really quick, I want to just say um, thank you to Caroline for organizing this amazing town hall. Um, and I also want to just give like a really quick shout out to Martin Hutchinson, um, who's with United Way and also just an amazing, amazing community. Um, person. He attended our first youth-led town hall that we had about a couple of years ago. And it was still, we worked with our um, previous interns and, and Salisbury Social Work students and we held it at Truett Community Center. It was one of like a really cool thing um, to be in the community and do and have the conversation. And one of the feedback that he gave to me was, I want to hear more youth. Um, I want to hear from youth who have lived experience. I want to see them in the forefront. Um, and I took that to heart. And so I want to thank Martin for giving us that feedback. And, you know, two years later, because, you know, COVID and bills and everything else that comes in between, we have now been able to do a, a, youth, a truly youth-led town hall. Um, and so I want to thank the Greater Salisbury Committee for contributing to this uh, town hall. I also want to thank the city of Salisbury for opening up this space and truly making a, a headquarters, a municipality headquarters, you know, where they have to do the bills and all the boring stuff, but at least open up their building to the community. That's important. Um, I think it's really important for the community to know that their space is theirs. Um, and I also want to thank um, PAC 14 
for being here. Um, in the back, making sure that we're able to, fa this is uh, stream Facebook on um, Facebook Live on PAC 14, and we also share on the Phoenix Youth Project. Um, and I also want to thank the individual donors that contributed um, to making sure that this uh, was able to happen. So we did put in our registration form is if you can financially contribute, um, please do so. And I was very happy to see that there were or people who wanted to make sure that there was education, there was awareness put in their community. So this town hall would not have been able to happen if it wasn't for the community and the partnerships that we have built with Phoenix Youth Project and the passion and the compassion um, that the these interns and, and the youth that they are serving have kind of, you know, spilled over. So th those are my closing remarks. I, this would not have been able to happen without the young people that I see all the time and they're graduating and leaving me and it's, I'm sad. <laughs> I just want to thank uh, first and foremost Amber and the uh, Phoenix Youth Project for having me out as a representative of the National Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, thank our representative for being here and all the work that he does as well and our future and our future case managers that are coming up. When I think of youth today, uh, I'm six months away from being 60 years old. So when I think of youth today, I don't think of an uh, adolescent and I don't put a number with it. I think of people who are at the forefront, the infancy stage, the adolescent stage of things to come. So you are in the early stages of our future. That's what youth means to me today. And when I look out here and I see that, I'm excited because you're taking action now. You know, I look at some of you all here, and at your age, all I was thinking about was uh, uh, a degree or, or the next fancy car or my next fine date <laughs> or whatever it may be, but you're living in a time where this world has changed. Our society has changed. But you will affect the change, and you will affect the change to come. So thank you for just being active. I don't know that I have any profound closing comments other than to say that um, uh, this is my shortest commute uh, since I started this job as secretary <laughs> a year and uh, year and like three months ago, a year and two months ago. Um, you know, I, I live down the street. <laughs> and, and I don't get to spend a lot of time in my hometown. I, I, I leave at early morning, get back in the evening, um, and I get to see all of our beautiful state. Um, but let that be a reminder that there are people here that need you, right? Um, there was a point in time in my career where I thought uh, if I didn't go to New York to work or Washington, D.C. to work, that I wasn't doing meaningful things. Mm -hmm. But look around you. Look at the people in this room. Look at the people out there playing in Unity Square. Look at the people you encounter on the street. They need you. And most of the people in this room are in the people business. And I don't just mean like, you know, you're trying to sell people something. Everybody says they're in the people business, right? You're literally in the helping people business. Mm -hmm. And there are people right here in Salisbury, Maryland that desperately need you. So don't be afraid to make change even right here. AKA don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for letting me be here with you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Phoenix Youth Project for having me. I miss you guys so much. It was such an awesome experience interning for FYP. Um, and I think that this town hall was uh, an awesome way to kind of launch me into my social work career. Um, just being surrounded with such profound people and profound remarks um, has been really inspiring. So thank you all so, so much. Just gonna do a plug, Phoenix Youth Project is currently accepting applications for uh, fall internships. And as you see, we continue to do work even after you leave. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> help us help them. Yeah. Thank you guys. So